before we get started. Um, this is the webinar, Following the Money, the History, and Where We Are Now. Um, first, people who are kind of slowly joining us, because that's the way that's going to work, is that um, we're going to encourage you all to check out this political cartoon. And if you know who it is, I would encourage you to go to the chat function, which you find at the bottom of, of the, the Zoom information, and chat if you know who it is. A little bit about what this is about. Um, and when you're also there, I'm going to encourage you also um, to put in your name and where you're from. And so once again, uh, welcome. I'm Catherine Terser. Um, and we're really pleased that you're here for following the money, the history, and where we are now. Um, and so we'll begin very, very soon with uh, this presentation. Uh, please put your name into the chat function. Um, and then you're going to find an area that is Q and A. So question and answer. Um, we are blessed today to have uh, Jessica Dickinson with us. Jessica Dickinson is with the Ohio Fair Courts Alliance. Um, and she um, organizes a lot of different discussions and does a lot of really interesting work. We also have Michael Barron, and Michael is with the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland. So I'm going to go kind of through my presentation, um, and both of them are actually going to help you, uh, you know, answer questions. They're going to put some links into the um, chat function so you're able to actually use that. Um, and so you'll see the chat right there. Let's see what we have. Ooh, look at this. Hello, Gary. And we have Karen from Wayne County. And so people are slowly getting on. We'll get started in exactly one minute. Um, so, you know, please, you know, put your name in um, where you're from. And we want to welcome you. I was glad to see that Jeanette's here uh, from Dayton. Uh, and since we have a political cartoon in front of us, I encourage you all to look at the political cartoon. One of the things I wanted to do with this presentation is talking about money and politics can in fact be fairly painful. You know, um, money and politics is about power and it's about um, moving an agenda. And some people have a lot of money, some people do not. And it can actually be very difficult to take um, and to take in. And so what we're gonna do with this presentation is I'm gonna talk kind of about the history of money and politics. We're actually gonna go back to George Washington, who knew? Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about current attacks of dark money on democracy, on voting, on redistricting reforms, on a variety of things that many of us care a lot about. Um, one of the things I'm super glad about is that Kathy from Mercer County is here with us. Oh, and look, Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Anyway, we're, we're very blessed to have so many of you. And we're at 702, so this seems like a good time to begin. Uh, do you agree, Jessica? I do. All right. Okay. So we'll begin here. I uh, I selected this uh, political cartoon. Um, this is Boss Tweed. If you and this political cartoon is interesting um, because this political cartoon is interesting because this cartoonist was actually able to take down this man who created this patronage system in the 1800s um, simply by doing political cartoons. He was able to highlight how unfair that patronage system was, what that kind of democratic machine was actually doing to the people of New York City. Um, and highlighting political cartoons is the way we're actually going to talk about money and politics. Go ahead. So technological issue, just a second. Ah. My charming assistant is helping me. Okay, <laughs> I know, and my charming assistant is helping me. So um, if, what is I gonna say, Jessica, if you are able to add some information about Boss Tweed and just now the cartoonist into the chat function, that'll give people a little bit of information about them. There you go. Pardon me? I've got that right up there. You rock. So I wanted to start today, um, as we talk about disclosure, we talk about the transparency of government. Um, a lot of us are thinking about the accountability and transparency when it comes to the police. When we, we think about just the nature of the need to have information so that we can actually make appropriate changes. 
And when it comes to money and politics and disclosure, it is important for us to be able to understand who is trying to influence public policy, who is trying to direct uh, the kinds of decisions that policymakers make, who's um, trying to get contracts. We need to have that information so we can root, root out quid pro quo and so that we can address the kinds of corrupt practices that impact you know, us every single day. Um, and so that's really why we're caring about transparency. Now, in November of 2019, um, the campaign, the campaign uh, center, uh, the campaign, I'm sorry, tripping over my own tongue, the campaign legal center actually did some polling and they worked with a couple, couple different pollsters. You know, generally they do that with a Democratic pollster and a Republican pollster. And so they, they did this with ANL Research and GS Strategy Group. And what they found is 83% of voters supported public disclosure of campaign contributions. Now this is disclosure involving elections. So not, not just talking about the contributions to candidates, they're talking about the, the disclosure of who is funding political advertisements as well. Now what's also interesting is that 56% of those that they spoke with said, hey, I strongly support it. It's not just that I support it, I actually really care about this. And so as we talk about disclosure and we talk about open government, we need to have a sense that um, what we're asking for, what we're looking for is something that so many of us want. It's not some kind of you know crazy idea. We for a long time have wanted to be able to follow the money and to root out corruption. And so as we think about this, that intensity of support crosses partisan boundaries, so Democrats and Republicans, independents, it also um, goes across demographic lines. And so there is robust, robust support uh, for making sure that we're able to actually follow the money. Now, um, this one, I'm not a crook. I love, I love this one here, uh, this one here with Nixon. Um, and that reference back to that Thomas Mast, car, you know, political cartoon and the power of over the years relying on how do you, how do you use art? How do you use journalism to actually move things and to, to, to actually get the kind of legislation that will make a difference for people? Um, so now, as we've been talking about, about um, the kinds of things that set the stage for today. I wanted to talk to you a little bit, a little bit about kind of our current context. So I talked a little bit about the polling. The other thing I wanted to highlight was a decision that just came down. Um, this would have been in the very beginning of June, a decision came down from the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, hey, we are not going to hear a case. Now, not hearing a case is not generally one of those areas where you're like, oh, that's so interesting. I, I can't believe they're not hearing the case. This is definitely a sign of something good for democracy and disclosure, right? It's, that's not, you know, you, you don't necessarily think that. On the other hand, it really makes a difference because the lower court made, and I, you'll find I'm moving this over so that I can read it. Um, the lower court was challenged. Uh, the, their decision was challenged but they had decided that in fact, um, Montana has these very strict disclosure requirements and the National Association for Gun Rights challenged it and said, we don't have to disclose this. Disclosure is unconstitutional. And they took it, um, they took it up to um, the, the federal level. So they, and that initially um, went through the Ninth Circuit. Um, and so this is uh, Judge Marsha Burzon and this is in August of 2019. She said, Montana's disclosure requirements for political speech that mentions a candidate or a ballot initiative in the days leading up to an election reflect the unremarkable reality that such speech, express advocacy or not, is intended to influence the electorate regarding the upcoming election. Now, when the Supreme Court said at the very beginning of the month that they didn't in fact want to hear the case, they were letting that decision stay. Meaning a state that has stricter disclosure requirements than Ohio, 
That is, has been found to be constitutional because the Supreme Court didn't actually hear it. Now, as we think about other kinds of decisions that make a huge difference, this is, this is actually from earlier this year. This is from April of this year. This is Doe um, versus the Federal Elections Commission. Now, you know the Federal Election Commission has been having all sorts of struggles since the Citizens United decision. Um, and what they were be, being challenged in this case was that they shouldn't actually have to reveal the donors to a nonprofit. So this becomes a little bit complicated. Basically, now or never reported giving $1.7 million to the American Conservative Union. This is the organization that sometimes we'll hear CPAC. It's this huge of conservatives um, that we hear about every year. Um, but what became really confusing is it looked as if they couldn't figure out how, where the money actually began. And since the money was being used in a pack, it became like a straw donor. If one nonprofit gives to another nonprofit to run an ad, well, where did it actually start? And so in, in, in um, March of this year, and I noticed I said April earlier, excuse me, it was March 23rd of this year, the Supreme Court said, you know what, we don't, you know, that in fact, it is constitutional to have disclosure. It's constitutional for the Federal Election Commission to do, to do this, basically. And they say this by not actually hearing the case. And so as we think about the kinds of things that are in place, we have had affirmation this year that in fact, good disclosure is constitutional. And we know there's a real benefit to being able to follow that money. Um, and, and you know, one of the things I think that is super important is as we think about the challenges that we face today, you know, I think we're thinking a lot about racism. Um, you know, we spent many years thinking about, you know, the power of gerrymandering. But we have to realize the power of money and the power of someone having much more money and we don't have as much shouting out all of these other voices. And if we do not take advantage of the tool of disclosure, then we're not going to actually be able to advance all these different ideas. And we won't be able to consider the kinds of ideas that are that are out there. We all need to know, you know, if you if you see an ad, is it first energy or is it the school teachers? Is it the Farm Bureau or are you talking about BP oil? Like we actually need to have the information to consider what we think about it and the context for it. Um, and so as we're thinking about the history of disclosure um, and all of these, I thought, you know, what we're going to do is say, what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to go through a process. We're going to say, you know, well, what do we know? What we know is strong support. There's strong support in the polling. We know strong support for transparency. We know it's constitutional. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide an overview, kind of a history of money and politics, and then how secret money has attacked democracy. And then we're going to have a conversation about, you know, well, what can we actually do? It's been 10 years from the, since the Citizens United decision. Many of us are really frustrated. And what are the kinds of things that we could actually do to make a difference? Now, Jessica, any questions that I should be answering? I was just answering one about um, the name of the PAC you were talking about in Doe. So that was the American uh, Conservative Union. Um, other than that, people are listening very intently. All right, well, thank you everybody once again for being with us. Um, so, you know, because we're Ohio, I always think of this one Ohioan when it comes to the history of money and politics. And it's a guy named Mark Hanna. Now, Mark Hanna was a US Senator. He was from Cleveland. Um, many of us, you know, when we go into Cleveland and we're in the, the kind of the, the theater district, um, we'll see the Hanna building now, Mark Hanna um, was kind of the Karl Rove of his days. He um, was, was very good um, raising money, and he mostly raised money um, from the railroads, um, the, 
the, the kind of when you when you think of that time that time period uh the folks that uh were shall we say taking advantage of regular regular ohioans he was out there uh, with standard oil and uh raising a ton of cash for um, william mckinley uh and this is what he said about politics and he said there are two things that are important about politics the first is money I don't remember what the second is. And uh, when we think about that, you know, the, that notion of, I don't remember what the second one is. Mm -hmm. I think for many, many people that are part of the rat race to raise enough money to stay in office, the folks that are thinking about political power really being equivalent with the ability to raise money and the ability to buy advertisements, um, that it's really different than the way that we often think about political power and coming together and we're trying to make it so that so many of us are able to vote and so many of us are able to have elections that are truly meaningful. Now, um, I, I mentioned Mark Hanna because I think uh, that quote is deliciously evil and a little bit funny um but and and perfect it's and just perfect. perfect i know it's, it's perfect <laughs> <laughs> so uh I, I but i also wanted to say we should always think back to to, to george washington now usually when we're thinking about money in politics we're not generally thinking about our friend george washington right and yet in 1757, yes, you heard me correctly, 1757, this was actually before the Revolutionary War, just to give us all context. In 15, 1757, George Washington was running for the Virginia House of Burgess, and he spent $195 on what you might think of as outreach, um, $195 on punch and hard cider for his friends. Um, and you might say, well, wait a second, he spent $195 in 1757. How much does that actually equal? Well, not surprisingly, that is almost $3,000 in booze. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now what basically happened is that in fact, um, the, the House of Burgess was like, oh, that is a lot of money. That's kind of a problem. And they decided to put a prohibition on candidates or those kind of working in their behalf for providing voters with money, meat, drink, entertainment, or presents for their vote. And so this is the first time the, in the United States, now this is before we're even the United States, we're this colonial America where we where we established a, a campaign finance guideline. Now, what's interesting about that is, I don't know about you, but I was one of the people that spent some time trying to figure out how we were gonna navigate the vote by mail when we changed to an all vote by mail system. And one of the um, things that we were told as nonprofits is that we could not pay for the postage to get the ballot applications into the board of elections and we couldn't pay postage for ballots either. Not so both the application and the ballots because it was considered giving something of value so that someone would vote. So we have moved way beyond kind of what what they were thinking about in 1757 about, you know, hey, we shouldn't give anything for voters and and because we want to be really clear that no one is buying anyone's vote. Um, there are prohibitions on even paying for postage when it comes to vote by mail. And so as we think about, you know, the kinds of decisions that we've made, um, and, and here, you know, I picked this polit political cartoon because, you know, I envision our forefathers and some mothers, but forefathers, you know, thinking about the Declaration of Independence, spending time on the Constitution, and yeah, there were a bunch of white men, but they had some interesting ideas and they started us off. Um, but, and then to get to a point where money doesn't necessarily equal speech or does equal speech or 
you know, some of the things that make it so challenging right now. I just, I just love this, this political cartoon because I just thought, you know, it just, it brings it home how, how much has actually changed, but also kind of how much is actually similar. So now I wanted to highlight um, the 1883 Pendleton Service Reform Act. Um, and that was another one that's interesting. What, what was decided was that it was illegal to solicit campaign contributions uh, from your, your civil service people. So before this, basically we had this enormous patronage system and it was a way to say, hey, you can't, actually, you can't actually ask your employees for money. These are people that are civil service employees. Um, we need to end a patronage system. And of course that continues to be, you know, continues to be a challenge, you know, when we think about patronage. And I think we can think about recent, fairly recent history up in Cuyahoga County about a patronage system. But these are the kinds of challenges that we've been working through in our democracy. Now, I, I had mentioned, you know, um, our, our, our friend Mark Hanna. And with Mark uh, Hanna, you know, he was in a time period of those, those robber barons. And they, the corporations were giving enormous amounts of money. And in 1904, they gave a tremendous amount of money to a guy named Teddy Roosevelt so that he would get elected. Now, Teddy Roosevelt was an upstanding guy and he was like, you know, they're right. It isn't, it isn't actually right to do this the way that I did it. What we should actually, we should actually make some, we should actually make some changes. And so with um, Teddy Roosevelt, he advocated for saying that corporations should not be able to give directly to candidates. And so that was the Tillman Act of 1907 and so we have had a prohibition on um, individuals, this is individuals receiving at the federal level um, contributions from corporations since 1907. Now, a year after that, the, uh, the Ohio legislature said, hey, we're going to do the same thing. So for more than 100 years, we have had a prohibition on direct corporate contributions to candidates. And as we think about kind of the role of money and politics and, and the kind of overwhelming influence that corporate America can have, um, saying, hey, you cannot give directly to a candidate is, is, is really powerful. And it really gets to the notion that we want to have a democracy that is made up of the individuals, that we are we the people, that in fact, the corporations are an artificial entity that you know is important that we need to have you know we need to have corporations but but they're an artificial entity created by humans that are in fact the voters and they are the people of Ohio and the people of this country. Um, so I also wanted to highlight um, in 19, 1910 there was uh, the Federal Corrupt Practices Act and the Publicity Act and the Publicity Act which is super important is when we actually established more broad brush that in fact we needed good disclosure of dollars. So, you know, clearly if you say there's a prohibition on corporate dollars, then you actually need to have disclosure because how do you how do you actually figure out whether somebody received corporate dollars unless you actually have good disclosure. Um, and you have, you know, you have a mechanism for doing that. So, um, we've had since 1910 um, good kind of federal level disclosure, except for this one small problem. And the small problem that we had is that essentially no one was housing the disclosure information. So that even though it existed in 1910 and was held up to be constitutional at that point, um, a few years later, that in fact, because we didn't have somebody housing it like the Federal Elections Commission, um, we didn't actually have the ability, you know, we didn't actually have the ability to follow the money because, well, if you don't actually have a mechanism easily to do that, you can't, you know, there's no teeth to it. So essentially we had for, you know, more than 50 years, a pretty toothless disclosure rules. And that of course, leads us up to Watergate. Now, who of you, who of you were waiting to, to talk about Watergate? <laughs> uh, now, I, um, uh, you know, this is a total side note. 
um, when I was a child, I was very, very excited. I was going to get to go to see the president, which actually was not true. I was going to get to go out a visit on the White uh, visit the White House, but I thought, you know, I'm little. I think I'm going to go see. I'm go see the president. Um, and it turns out, turns out that on the day that I was scheduled to go to see the president's house, um, he resigned. And, and really, when I think about um, when I think about that moment of what what is it? I can't go. It was perhaps the beginning of my thinking about following the money. It was perhaps a moment of being like, well, wait a second. And I think for many people, you know, children, adults, many of the people after afterwards, when we um, when we came to Watergate, it became very clear that there were some things happening behind the curtain that we did not know and that we needed accountability and we needed to make sure that our elected officials, including the president, were accountable to us. Now, for a lot of people, you're not necessarily thinking about Watergate as a, uh, Watergate as a campaign finance scandal, but it, it really clearly is. And the reason that we should be thinking about it as a campaign finance scandal is that the burglary in the Watergate Hotel was financed with campaign cash. And because we did not have good mechanisms for good disclosure, we have no idea where that campaign cash came from. You know, there's stories of brown paper bags and, and you know, we have a sense of like what that was like, but it became very clear that we needed greater transparency, not just in terms of good public records and, and, and that time period led to some amazing FOIA changes or the Freedom of Information Act changes. At the state level, we completely improved our sunshine law um, in the 70s as a response to Watergate. Um, and it's important to think about the kind of campaign finance changes that were made to address you know, Watergate so that we would be able to follow the money. Now, um, we know that the Federal Elections Commission was established. We know that um, the, you know, the Congress said, oh, okay, we have an issue. We're gonna establish campaign contributions limits. Um, they also established campaign contribution, what they think of as a, a campaign contribution limits. They also established ex, uh, limitations on the expenditures of political dollars. Now, this totally makes sense, right? You know, if you have, let's say you have two candidates, maybe three, um, and they, they have a limit on how much they can raise, you know, um, we want to root out quid pro quo, we want to address corruption, we want to make sure that people are responsible, you know, you're an elected official, that you are responsible to all the voters, not to the specific voter that gives you a contribution. Um, so we, you know, they established lower, lower limits that, you know, they, not, not crazy low, they were still at two, $2,000, they weren't you know, crazy, crazy low, but these kind of lower limits. Um, and, and then they said, hey, we're going to give expenditure limits as well. Well, this of course gets challenged. And the reason that the expenditure limits end up being challenged is that the court, this is in Buckley versus Vallejo, the court said, yes, in fact, um, we should in fact limit uh, the amount that somebody can give. We, we need to address quid pro quo. There's a public good for that. It becomes a lot more complicated when it comes to limiting the amount that somebody can actually spend. By limiting the amount that can be spent, you're actually limiting their ability to get their message out about themselves. They can't buy their yard signs. They can't drive them, you know, gas money to get yourself to the debates. Um, they can't buy a radio ad. You know, you start to think about all the different times that money is needed to actually get your message out. And in Buckley versus Vallejo, the court said, not that money is speech. Money is the gas that makes the car go. And so, in fact, we cannot limit the amount the candidates spent. And if you're not limiting the amount the candidates can spend, then the limitations of how much is given, you know, an individual donor can only give this amount, 
an individual pack and only give that amount. Well, it becomes a weird game of trying to circumvent those limits if in fact there are no limits on how much a candidate can spend. And that of course, you know, impacted things from years to go, you know, years to come. Now, in terms of disclosure um, versus Vallejo, they were extremely clear that in fact, good disclosure, you know, is both a public good, a, a public good, and that it's constitutional. That in fact, we deserve to have information. We should be able to follow the money. And when we think about Watergate and when we think about Deep Throat and his, you know, words, follow the money. Um, I often think of that garage of follow the money. Um, that in fact, that's, that's absolutely right. You know, sunlight is the best disinfectant. We should be able to follow the money. Now, there was another court case that I think is, is important. This is in 1978. Um, this is uh, First National Bank of Boston versus Bilotti which also said that, that in fact, we should have good disclosure when it comes to political dollars. And in this case, the court said, people in our democracy are entrusted with the responsibility for judging and evaluating the relative merits of conflicting arguments. They may consider in making their judgment the source and credibility of the advocates. And that really gets to the heart of why we need really good disclosure. We need good disclosure so that we can consider where the information came from. And you know, we're living in this era of so much misinformation, disinformation, and we spend time trying to figure out where the information is coming from so that we can assess whether it's credible or not. Um, and when it comes to political dollars, we need to understand where the money is coming from. Now, I, I love this political cartoon um, because of course it's like the optimist. There's gotta be democracy in here somewhere. For many of us, um, for a long time, we've, we've had a awareness that our democracy is really broken. That we have to dig to actually find the democracy. And I'm, I'm guessing many of us that are on this call, we worked on redistricting reform because we wanted to have meaningful elections. And when we think about addressing the role of money in politics, this is all about, well, how is it that we actually have meaningful elections? What are the kinds of tools and ways that we can actually create more meaningful elections? Um, and so, you know, I think it's important as we're thinking about the challenges of democracy and the challenges as you know the challenges of citizens united and i've gone through some some cases related to disclosure y'all may not be you may be surprised to discover that citizens united versus the federal elections commission was in fact a disclosure case because of course the thing that we know about citizens united is that the supreme court decided that corporations are people. You know, I mean, I, 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 and you know, for many of us that decide to come on this, this kind of a webinar, we've been thinking about Citizen Use United for, for many years. It's um, been more than 10 at this point. And, and yet I'm gonna take a kind of a step back. Um, so, you know, when we go back to 1976 and we go to Buckley versus Vallejo, we know that the court at that point said, that money doesn't equal speech, but it is the gas that makes the cargo. And that was literally, you know, that's a line that was in, in the majority decision. Um, and when we get to 2010, the court essentially said that for too long, corporations had not had the opportunity to exercise their voice. Um, so, so what was that case about? Um, so Citizens United had a film about Hillary Clinton. Um, it wasn't terribly flattering and, you know, you can imagine the kinds of kinds of things, you know, we all we all went through election 2016. So you can imagine the kinds of things that were put into this, um, this advertisement. And, and what happened is that they were told by the Federal Elections Commission 
um, and that they couldn't actually run the ad because they wanted to do it before the primary in 2008. They said, you can't do that because it's an ad basically attacking a candidate who's running for president, federal election. You, you can't actually, you can't do that in that window. That's, that's what um, um, McCain-Feingold, the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act of 2002 says you can't actually do it. Um, well, uh, what happened is, you know, it, that was held up to be constitutional in 2003, that in fact, that prohibition that you can't be running these ads um, on using corporate dollars, you can't do that. Um, the corporate dollars would have been dollars from Citizens United, it was a nonprofit, it becomes a little bit complicated because, but, but it wasn't clear where the money originated. Um, so it was corporate spending. Um, unfortunately, um, in, in uh, Citizens United versus the Federal Elections Commission, they decided the US Supreme Court said, yes, um, that the corporation's rights had been violated, that they did have a right to speech and in fact, because the political ads were not contributions directly to candidates, that there was in fact no problem whatsoever. How can it be corrupting? Because there are political advertisements that are not run in any kind of coordinated fashion. It can't possibly be corrupting to have these type of political advertisements. Well, <laughs> You know, a charitable interpretation is naivete. That's charitable. But it does mean that the US Supreme Court essentially said that corporations have the same kind of rights as we do, the same kind of rights as voters, the same kind of rights as the people who go off to fight in war for us, the same kind of rights as, you know, a child who's, you know, hanging out outside right now, enjoying a little bit of sunshine. It, it seems completely, totally ludicrous. And that is the Supreme Court we've been under for 10 years. So on this very sunny day, I'm going to remind us that there is some sunlight and the sunlight has to do with in um, Citizens United versus FEC or the Federal Elections Commission, they actually emphasize the, mer the merits of transparency. Um, and I'm actually gonna read this because I actually think this is powerful. Um, they, said, they, they said there were merits to transparency uh, because they promote disclosure of expenditures. Prompt disclosure of expenditures can provide shareholders and citizens with the information needed to hold corporations and elected officials accountable for their positions and supporters Shareholders can determine whether their corporation's political speech advances the corporate interests in making profits, and citizens can see whether elected officials are in the pocket of so-called moneyed interests. This transparency enables the electorate to make informed decisions and give proper weight to different speakers and messengers. In other words, Citizens United may have said that corporations have First Amendment rights, but it also said we deserve to have access to information. Now let's take a moment for, to, like, like to that to kind of weigh in. We have had for the last 40 years, the US Supreme Court has consistently affirmed the right of good disclosure consistently said, hey, you have the right to that information. That information is power. It will help with us making good decisions to you know, per participate in a robust democracy to make good decisions when it comes time to going to the polls. We need that information. And yet, we don't actually have the kinds of information that we deserve. And so I, I want to highlight again, we know that disclosure is constitutional. We know that government transparency is a good, um, but we also know that there has not been the political will to make the changes necessary. 
Um, I, I wanted to highlight that both at the federal level and at the state level, um, elected officials have not successfully passed good disclosure of um, political dollars related to advertisements. Well, you know, and you can say, we'll say, um, sometimes I call them issue ads. Sometimes they call them independent expenditures. Whatever you call them, those political ads fall out of the realm of good disclosure. And in Ohio, um, we are operating under something that was written as a memo in 2010, where the Ohio Elections Commission essentially told people running those ads that they could voluntarily disclose their funding sources. Well, guess what? No one has voluntarily disclosed their dollars. No one is telling us where the money came from. And in fact, the last time that the state legislature significantly took up disclosure legislation was in 2010, 10 years ago. So there was a guy named John Husted. You might've seen him, you know, when you turn in for your daily briefing about the coronavirus. Um, he, I, I kind of love, did you, did you see the wonderful, um, the, the wonderful little cartoon um, video where he, tw he was the one that twirled, twirled around. Uh, that was a Laverne and Shirley one uh, with uh, Governor DeWine uh, and Dr. Amy Acton. Anyway, DeWine was the one who twirled through. Anyway, as we're thinking about Houston, he wanted, at, in 2010, he wanted to be Secretary of State, advocated for the passage of good disclosure of political dollars spent on political advertisements. And the bill passed in the Ohio Senate. This is a good thing, right? Significantly, you know, a heavily Republican Senate passes it. It goes over to, at that time, the Democratic House, and the Democratic House actually doesn't pass it. Because, of course, um, John Husted's running for Secretary of State, and they didn't necessarily want to make him look good, right? And we have not been able to move good disclosure at the state level since then. Now, we, 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 we um, folks that spend a lot of time thinking about money in politics and we spend thinking about voting rights and we think about money in politics, you know, we're used to having to very, very slowly make the kinds of changes that we need to make. And to know that it can take many, many years. You know, I first started working on redistricting reform in the late 90s. Um, and let's face it, we didn't actually pass congressional redistricting reform until 2018. And guess what? We still haven't actually redone the maps. So we haven't gotten to the implementation phase. Um, and so we do know that it can take a really long time to get to the kind of disclosure we need. So on this part of the thing, this part of the agenda, I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of examples of dark money in Ohio that make it really clear that we actually need to do the good transparency. And so the first one is, you know, when we think about um, dark money, we're often thinking, we're thinking about how they attack candidates, right? Okay, we imagine, you know, the kind of ads, you know, the swift boat ads, are we well, split vote ads, or we imagine these kind of attacks, stealthy ads that come after, you know, Hillary Clinton, or they come after, they come after Trump, you know, but they're, they're not, these, you know, that we know what they are, but we associate them with somebody running for Congress, maybe, or whatever. Um, and so, you know, the, when I think about um, dark money, there are candidate ones. And so a good candidate one that I think is really important to think about is, you know, this is a few years ago. Christina Hagen was running for Congress against a guy named Jim Renacci, um, and and uh, so much money was spent against her. And this is what she said: "I didn't budge when they came to my office to lobby me. I became the target of the company and its members who wanted to get it done because uh, because I wasn't going to be supportive." I'm sure that they wanted to make, you know, 
they make an example of me in my race for higher office. If you don't play well, this is what will happen to you. And Christina Hagen was attacked by dark money that turned out that it actually originated from first energy. Hmm. Now, interestingly enough, first energy is also an example of consumers and taxpayers being attacked by dark money. You know, we don't have to think that far back. You know, just about this time last year, First Energy uh, had a First Energy had an ad that was called from Generation Now, and so there were these ads. Uh, many of us received like these crazy crazy things in our mailbox suggesting that the Chinese government was trying to get our information and we should not we shouldn't sign any petitions because good heavens you know it was the Chinese government trying to get our information and these just horrible incredibly crazy ads um, about House Bill 6. And we know that House Bill 6 bailed out coal plants in Ohio and actually a couple in Indiana as well, which when you start to think about, you know, what we were, we were attacked by dark money and every time we pay our electric bill, it isn't just first energy, it's all of us. You know, you can, you can be an AEP person and we're giving us ch a chunk of our, our, of our money that we pay for our electric bill goes to bail out these people. It's just incredibly, incredibly sad. You know, we know that people feel so unhappy about socialism. And yet when you think about how often money is spent and invested to attack candidates or attack ideas, and we can't figure it out until it's actually all over. We can probably get lots of kind of signs and we can kind of figure out kind of what's going on, but until it's all over, it's really incredibly difficult to figure out how this is actually working. Um, and, and we end up paying for things that we, we really should not have to be paying for. Now, other ways to think about um, dark money that we know about um, has to do with 10 years ago as well. Now, we all, we all know that like 10, year, 10 years ago, we had Citizens United. Now, Citizens United really set up Project Red Map to, to do the darndest because if, if in fact, you know, there are not limitations on corporations and as long as it's not coordinated with candidates, there aren't really limits then in fact, it was super easy to attack um, legislatures all over the country. But you know, they picked, they picked Florida, they picked Ohio, they picked Michigan, they picked Wisconsin, they picked Pennsylvania. They were going after those swing states and they were going after states where at least one chamber was democratic. And in this particular case, we're talking about at the state level. Because when it comes to drawing congressional districts, generally it is those state legislators, state legislators that draw those lines. And so those candidates for the state legislature, you know, they didn't see what was coming. They did not see what was coming. They were awash with advertisements, just completely questioning their integrity. And, you know, you don't actually need to spend that much when it comes to a state house race. And what we know that happened is with Project Red Map is that in fact, um, the legislature split. You know, the Democratic Ohio House, which was just only a short period of time Democratic, but it switched to being a Republican. Wisconsin flipped, Pennsylvania flipped, Florida flipped. And then they started drawing the district lines in 2011. And so we know that we have incredibly difficult and unbearable districts. You know, I, you know, we can we can start to think about. You know, uh, it's interesting. I know that Kathy um, from Mercer County is on here. She lives in that duck just district. So Jim Jordan's district that has you know its bill that's like up in Lorain County and it's shaking its tail feathers down in Mercer County, which 
He's all the way on the Indiana border. So you, it's just this incredibly um, contorted district. And we all talk about the snake on the lake. Well, all, you know, yes, that goes back to gerrymandering, but we cannot forget the political dollars and the dark money that made that actually possible. Now, if you're interested in, in um, learning more about the kind of Project Red Map and the kind of map making in 2011, um, Dave Daly wrote this really good book, and it is completely worth checking this out. It gives you, you know, a, a real deep dive for those of us who want to look at it. You know, Jessica, if you're willing to share kind of the, the New Yorker article, I think that gives a good overview of, of the whole story and kind of gives you some information about that. I've got it posted up right now. All right, sounds like a plan. Now, the last one that I wanted to highlight, you know, we, we have an attack on the candidate. We have an attack on the consumers. We have an attack on the map making and now, it's an attack simply on voting. So um, the Honest Elections Project is a new group that is out there doing all sorts of things to stoke our fears of voter fraud. They are specifically focusing, they're newly created, they're specifically focusing on stoking the fears related to vote by mail. We're in the midst of a pandemic and they are out there stoking fears about voter fraud related to vote by mail. They have filed briefs encouraging uh, voter restrictions. Um, and you know, these are in Nevada, Texas, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Um, they have they run ads in Colorado, Florida, and Michigan, and they appear to be connected to the Judicial Education Project. And the Judicial Education Project is another group that you can't quite figure out who exactly funds them. Um, but what they have focused on is getting in conservative judges, pro-business judges into the federal courts. Um, they certainly were very active in getting Brett Kavanaugh in place. And so as we think about you know, the dark money um, what's really interesting is just the, how kind of interwoven things are. You know, sometimes you hear people talk about like kind of the Coke to Puss, that the, the Coke brothers will spend, uh, spend money on different organizations, different nonprofits that are loosely or closely affiliated, but to support one another's work. Um, and, and, you know, it's important to think about, well, if we, if we can't, I'm not sure what actually happened. If we can't actually follow the money, figuring out who's connected to who and how this all goes together is nigh unto impossible. Now, the other one I wanted to identify, you know, as having to do with voting um, has to do with the American Legislative Exchange Council. Now, many of us are a little bit familiar with ALEC. Um, it is a, an organization that gets together, it's comprised of members of different corporations and legislators, and what they do is they come up with model legislation. Their model legislation includes everything from stand your ground to, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> so to a variety of things related to bail bonds, um, they, oh, they do a ton, they've done a ton of like model legislation related to charter schools. Um, and in this particular case, um, Documented, which is this really interesting nonprofit that does a lot of kind of deep dives into um, dark money spending because it's incredibly difficult. You have to look at layer after layer after layer. And it's, you know, all very murky where every, you know, who funds what and it's all very murky. Um, they spent a lot of time doing both public records requests and trying to get information that is out there given to them. And so they recently did a story um, which included an email about a secret working group that the American Legislative Exchange uh, Council has. Um, and and th what they wanted to do is to address redistricting, reducing the number of ballot measures, and um, addressing their concerns with election law. Um, and so, you know, Jessica, if you can put, put the link to the documented series up, because I said, you know, it's one of those, like, I don't, we don't actually have a lot of information about it, 
But what is interesting is that state representative Bill Seitz, who's from is the Cincinnati area, is somebody who actually um, is on the email chain. And so we don't actually know what's going on, but what we do know is something's going on over there at the American Legislative Exchange Council. Now, I know that I hit on all sorts of different stories. And part of that is I wanted to give you a broad brush of, of what dark money is, how it kind of works, the importance of disclosure, the importance of transparency. But because dark money is, well, dark, <laughs> <laughs> It can be really hard to have a conversation about who paid for what and what it actually does and how much dark money there is out there. Um, but we don't have to actually live like this. This is not good for Ohioans. It's not good for the country. We deserve so much better. We deserve to actually be able to follow that money and, and, you know, that's really why I wanted to talk to you all about this today. And I specifically, you know, once we, you know, go through some questions and have a little bit of a conversation, I specifically wanted to talk to you about well, what, what can we do? You know, I don't want any of us walking away from this feeling disempowered. Sure, we can leave feeling angry because we live in a plutocracy rather than a democracy. But we should feel invigorated here because the Supreme Court has an affirmed a tool, a tool of disclosure. And we should do what we can to make sure that we shine a light on the dark money. And with that, I am going to uh, let Jessica and Michael, Michael, if you want to come back up, um, I wondered if there were some questions you wanted to ask me. We, um, let me see here. Um, Deborah uh, Hogsheed um, is a fan of your uh, political cartoons that you had picked out. <laughs> she is wondering if you would be sharing them so she could share them. So I am more than pleased to, to share my political cartoons. So, so my goal here was, hey, let's start a conversation a little bit deeper. Um, especially since we actually have some really good news when it comes to disclosure. And, and, you know, we've been talking about, you know, voting stuff and we went through this crazy primary and we have this pandemic and we have all of these other things going on. Um, but I thought, hey, we need to actually hit reset. That there is some really good news when it comes to transparency. Um, I am more than willing to share political cartoons. What I was planning is when we're done with this, um, when done with this presentation, and it'll probably be tomorrow morning, I'll send you an email that provides you the slides. It gives you a recording so that you can actually, you know, if you wanted to, you could actually look at this again. And we'll give you some of the links that we've been sharing, you know, sharing in the chat function. So that you'll have that kind of background information as well. I know for some of you, you know, like this is interesting, but you don't want to take a deep dive. For the rest of you, you're going to want to look at this information yourself, digest it, and we can go ahead and have a conversation in the future. So we'll be sure to get a good recording to you and to get slides to everyone. Oh, and it took many years to put these, the slides together. This, is, this has been an ongoing project. Jessica, when were you my intern? 2017, summer 2017. Okay, and I was going to say, did you work on political cartoons then, or was it just Jake who did that? <laughs> I did a little bit. I did. The okay, Jer I was going to say, <laughs> this is an ongoing project that I've had for many, many years, where I put the interns on coming up with some political cartoons to add to our 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 feast here. Yes. <laughs> um, we have some other questions here. Let me see. Are there avenues to promote transparency in the federal courts at this point? So, you know, the good news is that's not necessary. Um, the good news is that the, that the US Supreme Court has recently affirmed, like I, at the beginning, I started talking about the cases, um, specifically, especially the, the, the I'm, I was tripping over my tongue, specifically the uh, Montana case. Where, where the Supreme Court said, oh, we don't need to read this. You already said they had to disclose, that's good with us. 
well, we don't actually need to challenge this. And I, do, do any of you, you know, it's very hard for you to respond since this is a webinar, um, but I, um, I saw this interview recently with Brian Stevenson, um, uh, who is, uh, he wrote Just Mercy, that wonderful movie that came yes. out this past winter and this wonderful book. If you haven't had a chance to read it, I would encourage you to. He was asked about how he felt about the Supreme Court right now. And he said um, that he would be worried that this Supreme Court would not affirm Brown versus Board of Education. And, and so clearly this is a challenging Supreme Court. And there are all sorts of things when we start thinking about move to amend or ch completely changing so that money does not equal speech. That is thinking really broad picture. But what this court has now said repeatedly is that disclosure is a public good. Um, and so that we should, we should hold on to that and move forward. There is a question here, um, sort of a follow up. Are there different remedies for transparencies in election funding versus transparency on legislation attack ads? So I, so I think um, when it comes to the strategies, I think that we need to have a conversation about what exactly it is that we want from, from transparency. Now, when it comes to who would be the people or the government entity that would hold the information, so there are some differences between the kind of disclosure that we need that is related to candidates and political advertisements and the disclosure that we would need that's related to lobbying. And so like if we think about House Bill 6, we did not have good disclosure when it came to political dollars spent to advocate the passage of House Bill 6 and the repudiation of the ballot initiative that, that, that um, folks were trying to collect signatures to do. So we, you know, the strategies will have to be different as we think about lobbyist disclosure and disclosure relating to moving the electorate and to moving legislators that way and the those that are directly related to elections. Okay, let me see here. Michael, do you have any questions? Um, I am writing them down in the chat box. Um, one of the questions was, is this a bipartisan issue? Are there Republicans who might be in favor of increased money in politics transparency? Are there Democrats that are opposed to it? So certainly there is polling that suggests that there's broad bipartisan support. Um, there's also, uh, certainly we have people on record who voted in favor of disclosure of the funding of political ads in 2010. Um, one would be, for example, um, the auditor, Keith Faber, in fact, voted uh, for this. Um, there are folks like John Husted, who is a Republican, who continues to advocate good disclosure. Um, I, you know, one of the challenges that I, th one of the challenges that I see is um, the, the state house is dominated by one political party and they've become accustomed to not having disclosure. And it can be like, you know, people who have to explain who pays for things behave better, right? It encourages much better accountability <laughs> and much better truthfulness when it comes to advertising. And so we're we're entrenched in a weird system right now where I think there are Democrats that are in favor of better disclosure. I think there are Republicans that are in, in favor of better disclosure. It just hasn't come together. And certainly um, the leadership in the legislature has not indicated that this is one of their priorities. It doesn't mean that we can't encourage them to think of this as a priority. And it could be, it's just a matter of building momentum and more and more public support the way that we did with redistricting. Um, one of the things that's really cool is there are candidates who were up for election this year 
and um, we can participate in debates and forums um, and make sure that questions are asked about whether or not the candidates support good disclosure, whether they want to shine a light on dark money. Um, and so, you know, we may not be getting together, you know, in person, um, but I bet you there are way more kind of virtual forums where we can ask candidates where they stand when it comes to the disclosure of political dollars. Uh, Catherine, Betsy Rader wants to know, <clears throat> how do we increase attention on the, very, on the little transparency we do have? So when political spending is revealed, how do we make it more top of mind? So this is um, a really good question. Right now, we're in a time period where there are lots of shiny objects. There are there's sometimes there's so much information and coming from all sorts of different directions that it's very difficult to highlight the things that we all should um, pay attention to. This becomes particularly um, dramatic during, uh, shall we say, even numbered years. We get a lot of. Uh, uh, so what can we do when it comes to really highlighting things? When, when any of you see um, information about, uh, about um, entities spending money and, and it comes out like, even if it's much later, it's very important not, not to just be like, oh, wow, that was first energy. Well, you know, I always used to call them first evil. I'm not going to really worry about it because it's all over. Well, we all need to agree to amplify that. And, and I think Michael's right in that we need to figure out how to amplify that. Um, but I think if we all slowly make a commitment to one another to actually amplify when we finally figure out what the dark money is, amplify, uh, amplify those stories, share them on social media, highlight them as much as possible. I was thinking about Andrew Tobias, who um, writes for Cleveland.com. He did a story that looked at uh, looked at the money that was being spent, um, you know, the dark money being spent, and he spent time kind of tracking, you know, how the how the money was dark money affecting um, the primaries in the Ohio House, and that how that affected um, householders' leadership, and then he was doing, you know, dark money related to First Energy and how it impacted House Bill Six, and then just recently he did one that that looked at what happened with those First Energy Solution people where they basically were looking to, you know, basically do, do the kinds of things that would enrich um, their larger stockholders um, rather than address the problems that we, they, they purported to have. They asked for a bailout from us and then they were doing good things for, um, for their, their, their employees that uh, were high up in corporate first energy, which now has a new name and I don't remember it. <laughs> I know. Um, sorry, everybody. Um, let me see here. Is there a petition going around um, regarding disclosure? Um, Marcia would like to know, is there a petition initiative to get this disclosure in Ohio? So one of the things that um, I have been thinking a lot about is that we are going to have a real challenge moving, um, moving disclosure of dark money. Uh, and what, what I would like to do, and one of the reasons that I wanted to have this discussion today, and this isn't kind of the usual way that we do a webinar, is that I wanted to see if folks would be interested in being part of kind of a working group to think about, well, how, how do we actually get good, how do we get to good disclosure? Wh who are the legislators that we could talk to? Do we need to actually consider a citizen initiative, which is like completely ramping up? Um, it, and because any of us who collected signatures, no, <laughs> it is not easy to do a citizen initiative. Um, I, I'm looking at Jessica and Jessica, um, was uh, 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 ran basically with me um, petition central over a summer when we had no air conditioning. Um, <laughs> what I would like to highlight is it is super clear to me that a citizen initiative is an enormous amount of work. But much like the the Fair Courts Working Group became the Ohio Fair Courts 
uh, Fair Courts Alliance, and that we have moved ahead and we've kind of moved up a Fair Courts agenda. We're reaching out to all sorts of different organizations in different parts of the state that are working on Fair Courts and whether it's bail bond reform or it's addressing it's uh, a, addressing um, you know recusal when it comes to um, judges not hearing the cases of their campaign contributors. I you know the vision I have is we're we're here. We need to get to here. Um, and there are a bunch of different steps along the way. And I am hoping that some of you will want to be part of the conversation and part of the planning process. Um, and that we'll be able to work together to actually shine a light on dark money. Catherine, Greg Coleridge wants to know, did the Supreme's Montana decision include any reference to the uniqueness of Montana historically as being plundered from outside interests? for resources and thus uniquely legally permitted to have stronger campaign finance laws, including disclosure? What is interesting is that they did not highlight that unique history. However, I, you know, when I think about, um, uh, you know, every state in the nation at this point has a unique history of being plundered. Um, and Greg is absolutely right. For people who are interested in um, Montana's history, there is a movie that is literally called Dark Money. Um, and if you Google it, it's the kind of thing that you should be able to see either snippets of it that's, that's available that kind of give you a little bit more information. Um, and it's also uh, there, there's on PBS, there's a PBS area where you can get the whole thing. I think you have to do a couple different steps to get that information. But that movie is quite good in laying out what happened with them. Um, well, I talked about the robber barons. When we think about the Copper Kings and how they just stripped the land there and took advantage of people, and it was very, very dramatic. And yet, it's pretty darn dramatic right now how corporations are interfering with our human political power. Um, I wanted to, to highlight this, uh, which is not exactly a political cartoon, um, but I, I love the, the whole project of you know, if money is speech, right? Well, let's use money as speech. And this is a project that I'd encourage any of you to do. It's a stamp money out of politics. Um, and it's stamp, a stamp stampede.org um, where you can actually put a message about the problem of money and politics literally on your money. Jessica, any other questions? Let me take a look here. We got the Montana decision. We did have a question about, will there be changes at the federal level now that Scalia is gone in that he was pro-transparency? Um, so what I would say is that with, you know, with Scalia gone, um, they still affirmed good disclosure. So um, I, I do think we should be watching to see what happens to the court um, um, because every change can um, be, be swing things a little bit. Um, we should not be fearful that um, disclosure is in danger or in jeopardy at this point. If we pass legislation requiring at the local level, requiring the disclosure of ultimate source of funds behind an independent expenditure, would it work to require disclosure of donors to national or statewide organizations? Well, absolutely. Now, one of the things that I would say is that we want to be sure that the folks are actually in electioneering. So one of the things that um, has not been held up to be constitutional is the disclosure of political dollars to all nonprofits, for example. Um, you know, there is, there's some reporting that is given to the IRS, the called 990s, um, where all nonprofits need to give larger contribution information to the IRS. Um, but because of, you know, NAACP, at one point they went after their disclosure at a point in history where they would have been incredibly vulnerable um, to all sorts of attacks. Um, nonprofits have um, certain protections 
it's when they become engaged in electioneering or political advertisements um, that we need to get their information. And you're absolutely right. Like we could, we could be thinking about disclosure at very local levels. Um, we know um, that, for example, um, the Ohio, the U.S. House passed some good disclosure language, um, some good campaign finance reforms as one of their first pieces of legislation. It just didn't go anywhere because the Senate um, and the House are not in agreement with how to address disclosure. And in fact, some of the worst, like, like when we start to think about like, you know, we've had an affirmation of disclosure, but when we think about kind of the 2003 um, McConnell case, um, that, not, that McConnell is Senator McConnell, who is not clearly not a friend of good disclosure. Um, and so as we think about the federal level and we think about the state level, you know, um, I'm always really interested in the state level. And yes, we wanna help our folks at the federal level, um, but we might need to be thinking small, city, county, state, um, because the challenge at the federal level at this point is very hard. And also it can help build momentum. If you can make some, some wins at the state level, we could follow Montana's path. Um, we could make a case for other states doing as well. You know, when we think about redistricting reform and the work that we did on redistricting reform, I don't know if you noticed, just afterwards, there were five states that did the same kind of redistricting reform measures and they won. And so, you know, we went and want to build on our momentum of improving democracy. Any Is other questions? Go ahead. Is there anything being done at the corporate level through corporate management or through stockholders actions to obtain transparency and corporate financial giving? Political. So, so there, there are organizations that are working on the disclosure of corporate dollars. Now the argument here is if I'm a stockholder and the corporation is spending money to get engaged in politics, I deserve to know what you're doing with that. And so a, a number of different corporations have, you know, they basically, they, they get together for their stockholder meeting. They come up with some bylaws that say, hey, we deserve to have that information. That information generally becomes public because um, they're public, you know, they're, they're, they're public companies. Um, but it's the idea of like, how am I, you know, if I'm a stockholder and you're spending money well, what if I think that's a terrible idea? I don't even, like, I need to understand what's actually going on. And so the, the notion of good disclosure so that your money is being spent appropriately is not necessarily what I always think about, but it is a really interesting approach. And what I'll do is I, I don't have a kind of a link to give to, to Jessica to just put in right now. Um, what I'll do when I follow up is give some more information so that you can um, kind of get, so if you're interested in kind of the changes stockholders are making, or if this is an area of interest for you, it gives you a little bit more information, you can do a little more research. And I also can hook you up. I do know somebody who does some really interesting work in New York City about this stuff. We have a question here regarding the scale of money, in particular, um, transparent money versus dark money currently. Um, is dark money growing or is, tra is transparent money, um, you know, being, is there more transparent money than dark money? There is less transparent money than <laughs> dark money now. Now, it's interesting because we've come on this political cartoon where there's like this, you know, oh my gosh, you know, I'm get, being hit by this enormous wave of money. So, so, you know, 10 years ago, the transparent money um, was of course more. And yes, there was dark money and it mostly was like, can you figure out how to do this? Um, and they figured out how to do it. And so one of the things that is really interesting is all the different ways dark money plays into things. And so for example, you think about like the honest elections uh, the honest elections folks, will they also have an arm that does judicial work? And so they have different nonprofits and they're all kind of connected. There was this really interesting piece that was like about how um, 
the, how in 2018, it looked like there were these two nonprofits that were attacking people who, you know, basically, they were attacking the folks that were not friends of Householder, basically, that, that were running for office in 2018. So it would have been the primary 2018. Um, and it turns out they were actually three of them, but they were like Russian nesting dolls, which, you know, I'm not suggesting they're Russian. I'm saying that they, that they, they were actually all the same nonprofit. So like what can look like, oh, there's a little money here, a little money there. Well, you add it all up and it just gets enormous. Oh, you know what? I'll also make sure that you all get some information from the Brennan Center for Justice. Um, they've looked at dark money in all sorts of different areas, but they've also looked at it when it comes to the Supreme Court um, and not the US Supreme Court, but like the Ohio Supreme Court or the, the high courts of different states that actually do elections for their justices. And so what's really interesting there is they looked at kind of the rise of the dark money um, over the years. Many of us will remember, you know, this is 20 years ago, um, but many of us will remember when um, the Citizens for Strong Ohio spent a couple million dollars um, attacking Alice Roby Resnick, um, who was on the Ohio Supreme Court at that time. She was the person who was the author of the DeRolf decision. So the one that said our school funding wasn't constitutional. She also was the author of um, a decision of basically repudiating tort reform and the Chamber of Commerce came after her. Um, and that was dark money. It, it, it took us four and a half years before we were actually able to figure out which corporations actually gave to that. Um, and so it's not like dark money didn't exist 20 years ago. It's just like opening the floodgates. Oh, here we have the coctopus. <laughs> I do want to encourage you all, like if you, um, you're interested in kind of, kind of a deep dive into um, the Koch brothers and like, you know, all, all of that. There's a wonderful book by Jane Mayer um, who wrote, uh, basically it's called Dark Money. Um, and I'll also send some information about that as well so that you have, uh, you know, you can look that up and do a good read. Ooh. Also, if you want a copy and we're, I don't know, more able to get around in a little while, I have one in my office. So, um, you know, let me know, I'll share. <laughs> Catherine, we have a question about um, the new IRS rules that okay. eliminate the requirement um, the, about the 501c4 organizations filing their annual list of all their donors who contributed more than $5,000. Um, this organization has been used extensively to conceal the source of funds and dark money in political campaigns. Under the old rule, the donor list remains secret, and under the new rule, the IRS can still ask for a donor list on audit. In practice, how much is this rule change going to interfere with the discovery of the source of dark money, and can we do anything about it? Um. So, an exam. It would actually be interesting to have a webinar that looks at the role of the IRS over the years and the role of C3, C4, mm -hmm. 527s. Um, they're all, all of those different types of nonprofits, they're codes that were actually created by the IRS. And so it would actually, this, this type of question is somewhat complicated. <laughs> <laughs> You know that old like you know ask a lawyer a question and you get this answer well it depends um so it does okay all right so what i would say about this is that the irs has over the years been working under worse and worse circumstances when it comes to their ability to get accountability and so this this would be a good example um I talked a little bit about Alec, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're a C3. Now, what do we know about Alec? We know, <laughs> we know, for example, that they create model legislation. Okay. What else do we know about them? Their um, executive director received an award as one of the most effective lobbyists. 
So, okay, all right. So, so you know, the, the, the little pieces of, of here and there. Um, the inability to actually um, get the IRS to hold folks accountable. And you can also look at like enforcement related to, to inappropriate behavior by churches engaging in electioneering. Like there are a ton of different IRS things. So I guess what I'm gonna say to you is I can't easily answer that. What I can tell you is we get a lot of information about dark money after the fact because of the 90s that information that we get from the IRS. So without that, we get less information. So just broadly, there's that, but I also wanted to be very clear that it all, it's a little bit complicated because we, it's been a challenge no matter what. Thank you. Well, have we come to the end? I think so. There are, um... If there are other questions um, that we didn't get to, or you didn't, um, or you think of something later you want to ask, um, I'm going to go ahead and send those questions to Catherine. Um, she can uh, provide answers with the email she sends out with the links, and um, so we'll get you all of that information, um, and then any other questions we might not have gotten to. I think that sounds wonderful. I wanted to thank you all. When you get that email, you, this is an opportunity for you to sign up to help shine a light on dark money, be part of a, you know, a, a planning committee um, so that we can think about much in the future, um, how are we gonna get there? You know, we have clearly identified the problem. We know what the problem is. Um, it is not clear how we can get from a clearly identifying the problem to actually addressing it. And so, yeah, there's, there's, not, um, there's not legislation in the state house. We don't have bipartisan legislation. We don't have a clear path for 2020, but that does not mean we're not gonna have a clear path when it comes to 2022, but we do need your help. And so be on the lookout for that email. Everybody have a really good evening. And then please, you know, if there are questions that we didn't answer, see Tercer, see T-U-R-C-E-R, at commoncause.org, send me an email. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye.